Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Sika, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the San Francisco Film Critics Circle, sffcc.org, for more information. Uh, thank you for coming out uh, this evening to see this wonderful movie, Colette. The director and co-writer of the film is here with us tonight to talk about the making of the movie and to take some of your questions. Uh, he is Wes Wash Westmoreland, and he, along with his uh, late husband and movie-making partner of over 20 years, Richard Glatzer, to whom this film is appropriately dedicated, uh, are probably best known for their Humanitas Prize, Sundance Audience and Grand Jury Prize, uh, an indie spirit John Cassavetes award-winning Quinceanera, and the Oscar-winning independent film Still Alice, which, as many of you know, won Julianne Moore the Best Actress Oscar for that year. So. Please uh, extend a warm <clears throat> San Francisco welcome to the writer-director of Colette, Wash Westmoreland. <clears throat> Hello, thank, thank you for coming. It's, it's kind of dark in here, isn't it? Is there, yeah. Can we get like some uh, overhead lights? Um, yeah, no, I know that there's, yeah, there we go. Okay, hey, thank you, Wash. <laughs> I'm going to begin with several compliments because uh, the first being that I thought that this was a superb uh, screenplay, which you co-wrote with Richard uh, Glatzer and Rebecca uh, Lankowitz, uh, who wrote Ida. And the movie, well, we should probably start, the movie's dedicated to your um, late partner, Richard, right? Do you want to? Yeah, it, it was Richard's idea. Um, he was an avid reader, and he always had a nose in, his nose in a book. And this um first draft of the script for Colette was written in 2001. I mean, yeah. it took 17 years to get this film on the big screen. So if there's anyone out there with a project that's not moving forward, <laughs> don't give up. <laughs> Keep going. Um, and yeah, Richard became obsessed with reading. He read a Colette biography, and then he started reading her novels, and he's like, there's a movie in here. And I also started reading a lot of Colette stuff, and we focused in on the first marriage, between Colette and Willie as having this great natural arc of like an artist who's been suppressed, having to fight to find her voice and speak her truth. So that was always the, the kernel of the idea. And, uh, you know, it took a long time. It took, maybe we wrote sort of 18 or 19 drafts. We it had three title changes. Yeah. We had two false starts. I mean, God, everything <laughs> stopped this movie happening. So it's really nice to finally see it on the big screen. So you, you began in the summer of 2001, you said, in a, a dilapidated 15th century manor house. <laughs> yeah. With bats in the belfry, I think you said. Yeah, that was, um, that was a stroke of luck, actually. We went to Paris in August, because in August, Paris empties out, so there's lots of empty apartments, and we were staying in this friend's house that was empty, and um, visiting all of Colette's haunts in Paris, which really sort of filled us up and talking to a lot of Colette experts. And then a friend of ours said, oh, I have this place in the country. It's, you know, it's kind of run down, but you're welcome to it. So we thought, well, this will be great. We'll go out to the countryside, no distractions. So we went out there, and yeah, it literally was this isolated 15th century manor with, like, stag's heads on the walls and a bell tower with bats in it. And, like, it was really scary. We were like, we should be writing a horror movie. Did it have electricity? <laughs> yeah. It had electricity, but it didn't have... Um, it had this no really either. rubbish telephone that you had to put this special <laughs> card in. That, so we weren't using the phone. We weren't, there was no internet and there was no TV. So we got the first draft done in 10 days, which is what you can do when you don't have internet. <laughs> well, well, and wasn't there some additional serendipity with the friend's aunt that, who turned out it. to be close friends with some, well, we someone connected Well, we didn't really advertise that we were, um, you know, sort of writing about Colette because we're sort of like, well, we're, you know, two foreigners coming to France and Colette's a national heroine and, you know, we just want to sort of go under the radar at first. Uh, but we did tell our one friend, uh, Juliet, who owned this house. So after we'd finished the screenplay, she came down to stay. And she goes, I hope you don't mind. I told my aunt, because my aunt is friends with someone called the Baroness de Juvenel, who I believe has something to do with Colette. And we're like, that's Colette's step-granddaughter. And she controls the entire Colette estate. <laughs> So this just complete random thing. See, that, that's when, of, yeah, that's uh, when you kind of know, like, well, maybe I'm really supposed to be doing this. Well, right? yeah, maybe Colette's going, like, no one's told my life story yet. Let's give these guys a go. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, it was, it was this sort of great serendipity, and we ended up in, back in Paris. We had this tiny little flat again, 
this baroness was coming around. We're like, oh, my God, we bought really fancy wine, really fancy cheese. She came <laughs> around. Of course, all she wanted to drink was water because it was like a business meeting. And we did it in French. Richard's French is really good. Mine's really terrible. But um, she sort of took a shine to us and sort of said at the end of the meeting, I give you my blessing. And she stayed true to that for 16, 17 years until the film was made. Wow. Second compliment, too. I know you probably heard this like a repeating chorus because the movie received rapturous uh, notices out of Sundance this year where it premiered. But um, what's so astonishingly, for me, satisfying about this picture is that its period detail is so rich and authentic, you actually do feel like you're there. Um, and on top of that, you've made uh, a picture that overflows with contemporary relevance and resonance. I mean, the timing, t for me, for this picture is unbelievable. Um, yeah, it's it's extraordinary. It's good it took 17 years, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, maybe it, 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 the the way it's connected with things that are happening today, no one could have foreseen. Richard and I could have never foreseen that. We knew Colette was ahead of her time. When we used to go and pitch this to um, studios back in 2002, and we'd be like, and then when the marriage starts to go under strain, Colette forms a relationship with a woman who is identified as a man and is really a forerunner of today's transgender community. Mm. And we just get this blank stare, like, oh, that's really niche. And we'd like... <laughs> <laughs> And the, you know, huge um, leaps of, uh, of uh, ch transgender vis visibility that have happened in the last 16 years have sort of, in a way, prepared the way for a, a story that is a heterosexual marriage with uh, LGBTQ elements in it that are very relevant and part of history. It was a very, very rich time period. Uh, a lot of creativity, a lot of artists, the Impressionists were painting, Debussy and Sarti were composing. It just had this incredible density. And we wanted to make sure we represented that but at the same time, it wasn't just like the technology, like the cars and the telephones and the gramophones that were changing life. It was these new ideas about gender and sexuality that yeah. were just breaking. And Colette was right at the forefront of not just like writing about it, but living it in the public eye. What's so funny, too, because as we speak, you know, there's the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court nomination weighing upon all of us. But you said that this movie was about, and I quote, the beginning of the modern age where there was a Teutonic shift happening in gender roles. Women were demanding more power in all areas of life and men were resisting with all their might." End of quote. Not much seems to have changed Not in much has years. changed. I know. Um, you know, like when Colette says, um, you thought I'd never break free. Well, you're wrong. I mean, that's Christine Blasey Ford right there. What a hero. I'm going to have one more and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, regarding Colette's life, uh, the movie dramatizes her, I guess, formative years, you'd say, uh, as an artist and a person. And I think in Toronto, you acutely stated that if you look at Colette's incredible life, there's enough stuff in there for a good four or five seasons on HBO. But, but did, did you, did you and, and, and Richard and Rebecca struggle at all with what aspects of her life you would emphasize? I think you, I think you nailed it. Uh, and, and what you wound up with was just right. But while I was watching it, I thought, well, how did they know how to do this and what to emphasize? Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's really an origin story. It's about her birth as a writer. The book you see her writing at the very end was the first time she was really acclaimed as a force in literature. So, it, it, you know, it is how she became a writer, the story. Um, there would be great other movies about Colette in 10 years' time being a reporter, you know, uh, marrying a baron, um, shagging her stepson, <laughs> um, all kinds of controversial things she did. Then in the final marriage, that's another movie, she was, uh, she was in she Paris during the Nazi occupation and she was married at that time to Maurice Goudiquet, who was Jewish, and they took him away to a concentration camp and she had to get him out. Jeez. So there's really all these different amazing stories in and Colette's why, life. Did she get a, a venereal disease too, or that was... That was, um, some books um, have theorized that she might have, but it's kind of like, you know, 1895 and she was ill for a time. No one knows exactly what it was. Um, so, it, you know, it, maybe, maybe not on that one. Sometimes it's like you, you have to leave some things out. If we we're going to deal with that, it would be a long sort of dig into the story. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, in a way, you'd want to make a movie about the whole of Colette's life, but it would be at least six hours long. So maybe I'll just call up Kira in 10 years' time and say, let's do part let's two. do another one. Yeah. Um, anybody, I want to get you on the mic so I don't have to repeat the question. And, of course, the first question is way, way at the top. <laughs> All right, here we go. Could you pass the mic down, please? 
Hi there. Beautiful film. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Um, how did you get Kira? Um, you know, um, a journalist asked me at one of my first interviews, was Kira the first person you thought of for the role? And I was like, well, the script was written in 2001. She would have been like 14. <laughs> so <laughs> Bend It Like Beckham hadn't even happened yet. Um, but when, like Richard and I were always thinking, oh, who could be Colette? And we don't, you know, sometimes we'd see a movie and we'd be like, oh, okay, there's some Colette in this actress. And when we saw Pride and Prejudice, even though Kira was 21, she just so nailed the role and just tore Mr. Darcy apart mercilessly. And we thought, oh, there's something here in this, you know, very young actress. And um, the movie kind of, you know, went to sleep for a while. We, we did have worked on other projects. And the last movie Richard and I made together was Still Alice. And after, uh, we actually, you know, w he was, the last four years of his life, he was living with ALS. And um, he, um, you know, just fought really bravely to be a filmmaker and not be a person with ALS. You know, that was his focus. But um, after Still Alice, um, you know, it, won an Oscar, we thought, oh, we got a springboard into another movie right now. And I said, what's it going to be? And he said, Colette. I said, but who could play her? And he said, Kira. And at the time, he was typing with his toe on a machine. And uh, he died two weeks later. But I sort of knew what I had to do. And um, we um, went out to try and make the movie with Killer Films, Christine Vashon and Pam Koffler. And um, we sent the script to Kira. And I was at the Shanghai Film Festival, and I got an email, oh, Kira's interested in talking to you, which was always a good sign. <laughs> but the internet in China was really, really bad at the hotel I was staying at. I was like, how am I going to do this? So I went to someone's penthouse, who was a friend of the festival, and it was this crazy party, and Mike Tyson was there, and Jackie Chan was there, and I was <laughs> rushed away into this side room and meant to do this Skype call, and the Skype was just not working at all. I thought, oh, I've blown it. And then my phone started ringing. Kira Knightley was FaceTiming me. And I was like, oh, this is brilliant. Kira's face appeared in my palm. And then I looked up at the battery, 15%. <laughs> so we talked incredibly fast, which suits her down to the ground because she's just so quick and so smart and just gets it. She's got a brilliant sense of humor. She's very down to earth. She got what the part was. And I looked and it was 2% and the battery was red and flashing. And I was like, no one in the world can do this as well as you can. Let's do it. And she goes, why not? And the phone died. <laughs> Wash, when you're writing a script like this about a person who lived in a specific era, there's always the question of, of, of the issue of veracity, I guess you'd call it, you know, historical truth vis-a-vis -vis, uh, emotional truth. I think, I think you said somewhere that everything in the story is based on a true event, but you changed some details in order for the story to work. What were some of those changes and, and yeah. you made well, to the historical facts, and why did you make them? Well, the, the great thing about Colette is you don't have to make a whole lot of stuff up because it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, she really did dance at the Moulin Rouge. She really did cause a riot. She kissed Missy. She caused a riot. She was locked up to write books for Willie. You know, she went on the stage. She toured around France as a woman on her own exposing her left breast at a time when women were still debating whether to show an ankle. She did all that stuff. Um, the stuff when you're writing a, a screenplay is to condense the whole sort of, um, you know, banquet of events into a, a digestible meal <laughs> of, like, the story of her being, you know, as a, her birth as an artist. So that was mainly about excluding a lot of stuff that happened, but we just didn't have time to go into, you know, there were several other affairs with women. It would have been nice if it had been the HBO, um, you know, <laughs> long version. It would have been nice to kind of go into some of those other affairs and her, you know, relationship with the artistic lesbian underground that was burgeoning at the right. time was all very interesting. Um, the main thing is there's a slight elision between Willie's between the marriage ending and her having a relationship with Missy. Um, Colette and Willie separated and then Colette met Missy. But Colette and Willie were still very tangled up for, in business and emotionally. And if you look at the letters between them, it's still very much this polyamorous open marriage. And so they were separated. But if we'd put that in the movie at the end of a second act, they separate, you'd kind of lose a bit of that feeling of like she's got to get out of this marriage. In the reality, it was more like she has, she has to get out of his sort of influence. You know, she has to get out. She has to break the uh, cord between herself and Willie. So that was um, something that we took artistic license with. 
because then you get this contrast of two different masculinities affecting Colette's mm. life. You get Willie's, yeah. it's all about me, you know, mm. like I'm the big man in the room. I mm. frame magazine covers of myself on the wall, not like anyone else we know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Missy is more like, no, it's her, Missy's masculinity is about self-actualization and personal strength and finding your true self and the ability to support someone else who you love. So by yeah. making that change, we do that contrast. It's such a, a fearless story of, of gender um, and, and, and sexuality. I hadn't re fully realized how trailblazing uh, this woman was. The, the kiss on stage between Colette and um, Missy, is it true that that was the first documented same-sex kiss on stage? Um, I th don't know. I, I can't, can't be like a complete historian on this. I know it was, I th haven't heard of w another one. Yeah, but I feel that it, it was at the time Paris was felt like an open and permissible place compared to Victorian London, where you know Oscar Wilde, like everyone was saying, go to right. Paris, go to Paris. But still, Colette pushed it right to the limits of the Parisian bourgeois morality. And Missy's ex-husband, there's kind of a little sort of detail laid in about that. Missy's ex-husband, who was a closeted gay man, was really outraged that his ex-wife was dancing on the stage and he brought in the riot mob to kind of, you know, bring the performance down. What was the name of the play where she exposed her breast? What was? It was called Flesh. Flesh. Which is so Warhol. And Willie yeah. with his factory, that's what, he's had a factory, they performed Flesh. You know, Maurice Chevalier, um, at the end of his life, said, what was your greatest moment in the theater, <laughs> thinking it was gonna be like Shakespeare or, you know, something incredible incredibly high art and he said when I was 14 I sneaked into the back of a, uh, a provincial theatre and the audience was in complete silence you could hear a pin drop on stage Madame Colette was bearing her left breast <laughs> at a time when women were debating like how much ankle to show it was right? like out there performance art and yeah. it, it, if you think about why she does it it comes at a point in the story where Willie's denying her authorship and she's going for something that no one can deny that is her Mm -hmm. Like she's up there on stage, she's the one who's performing, she's the one who has that control and feels that sort of, you know, reward of performing and being, you know, challenging. Um, but it th completely threw her out of bourgeois society, like she was shunned in the, you know, sort of Parisian ar aristocratic circles, they wouldn't invite her around to social events anymore, she was seen as like, it wasn't like Shakespeare where she was you know, considered a grand actress. It was the musical, it was with the performing dogs and the Russian acrobats and the trapeze yeah. artists. And, you know, it was considered very louche what she was doing. And that's mm -hmm. why I love her so much. Yeah. Uh, questions? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the, I can't think of a really intelligent way to ask this, so I'm just going to ask it. Um, but does... does it, <laughs> Does being a gay man make it easier to tell women's stories? Like uh, I said, I can't, I can't think of a talk about way. the general, but I can talk about the particular. Because for general, I think it's all about you know one human being connecting to another, and that's what art is often about. That's often a very inspiring thing about art. Well, I mean, you, you know, you look at uh, George Cukor, for example, and all the amazing. Uh, performances that he elicited from his actresses. I mean, he got things out of some of these women that I don't think anybody else ever equaled. Right. And it's, I, you know, I, like I said, I, there's no intelligent way to ask that, but... Well, on a personal level, I, you know, growing up queer, north of England, you know, no positive role models, thinking, what the fuck's my life going to be? And then having that moment of breaking through and like, yes, there is a potential in life and there is a way to be loved and there is a way to be a complete human mm -hmm. being. I saw an analogy to what Colette goes through, that she is, you know, very much held down and her true essence is not recognized. And she, in a way, it's like a, a point of identification for me emotionally um, to say, okay, you know, if you, I was in the closet and saw this, I'd come out <laughs> straight away because it's yeah. kind of about speaking your truth, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I felt that connection. Um, and yeah, I, you know, feel I'm an ally, I'm a feminist ally, I'm an, a feminist. I, I just, I, I really identify with women characters in movies, always have, and uh, avoid like the male gaze, even though I'm a man. And I explained this to Kira and Denise when we were doing the sex scene, and was like, there's no male gaze in this scene. And they're like, you're a man. I'm like, I'm gay. They're like, well, that's the gay's gaze. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Can't win. <laughs> Was okay, good. All right, yeah. Oh.
hope so. I, I just wanted to, th oh, well, close, I guess. I just wanted to say you, you guys did an amazing job with this. I was really impressed. And um, the thing that was most disappointing, and maybe it had to do with the era, but how long it took her to get away from Willie was very disappointing. And uh, I don't know if that was the Times or her or Willie or what, but or maybe it was past life karma. <laughs> Well, I think, um, you know, she actually, she was with him for 14 years. I think so many women were just locked into marriages that they just couldn't get out of. You know, like divorce, it was seen as a scandalous thing, like getting out, economically cutting yourself out from, you know, the man would own all the property within a marriage. There weren't sort of, you know, the idea of fair divorce settlements. It, what she did when she got out was, was also fairly, you know, ballsy and groundbreaking, typical to who she is. But what we tried to show in the movie was that even though Willie was a despicable character, that he had this veneer of charm that actually you understood that he could be an appealing person to be around and have this kind of, his hold over her wasn't just economic and, and sort of socially sanctioned, it was also about a sort of personality thing, about his charisma. And uh, when you hear these stories about men behaving badly, it's, they're not running around with you know, horns coming out of their heads, they're often very charming people who use that to get what they want for themselves. So Willie, I think, um, was that type. Um, again, there's a modern day analogy. I'm sure you can think of someone who <laughs> exploited women very seriously and you know, knew how to push things into the public space very effectively, who's been uh, in trouble recently. I think there's analogies there as well in, in how men maintain power in different ways. Um, so I think it um, adds to the complexity that you can see all the different dimensions of a relationship that Colette just doesn't have to leave Willie pure and simple. She has to transcend something in herself in order to leave him. I think this would be a great time for this to be put out there in a very big way in some kind of publication that talks about this, that sort of thing. I can talk to you more about this. That would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank you for Hello. making the for making this film and for the persistence for, of doing it for so long. Um, I had two questions. One is, um, I love the locations that you shot in, especially in the urban areas. It, it really felt like we were in you know, the, the beginning of the 20th century. How did you, how did you go about site location? And then the other thing is, this is made by a non-French person, and it's also not in France. So I'm just curious how the French have reacted to the movie. OK, um, thank you for the questions. Um, yeah, I would have loved to have shot the whole movie in France. Um, because there's something about the feeling of France that I think is so unique. But it's really, really expensive to shoot films in France. Um, they work eight-hour days, and you know they have wine for lunch. <laughs> I'm being slightly facetious here, but there is literally a bottle of wine on the table at lunch, which is a great civilized way of making film, but it's just hard economically. So we, we shot most of the interiors in Hungary, in Budapest. And Hungary, around the turn of the century, really sort of worship Paris and emulated the st Parisian style of a lot of the interiors. Gustav Eiffel was Hungarian, there was a kind of connection. They have their own Champs-Élysées called Andrashi that runs down the center, and they have their own Moulin Rouge that was based on the original Moulin Rouge and has been boarded up all through communism and only just now sort of, you know, reopened. So it's very like the un a messed up version, whereas the one in Paris actually now looks like a Las Vegas nightclub. It's really disappointing <laughs> when you see it. So yeah, we shot a lot in, uh, in Budapest. We shot uh, some of our countryside in England, because around Budapest it's very flat, uh, um, and we wanted undulating hills and sort of dells and forests and things that captured Colette's connection to nature. And then the very last day we got to shoot in Paris, um, which was amazing to go there and um, you know see Kira walking down the Seine on the cobbles that Colette walked and Colette's granddaughter came down and it just the French crew were amazing and it was just like this feeling of like oh the movie's coming home. The French so far it's been very positive but it's very early days. Um, it's going to be released there in January and I'm going to go there and um, hopefully we'll see. I, I'm like this is about art transcending borders. Politicians are busy enough trying to erect national borders between countries and stop kind of a cultural cross-pollination happening. Whereas really, I think what artists can do is reach into different cultures and see similarities and stories that need to be told from you know other parts of the world. And um, I 
opted like there, there was a French version of uh, Colette's story done in 2004 by um, Nadine Trantignon and so Richard and I were originally going to do it in French but then we said no we'll do an English version so it'll go out to a different audience that maybe are not as familiar with Colette's story and kind of make it fresh in that process so it became the English version of Colette I'd also like to thank you for the film. I was wondering when you talked about and how, how it was received in 2002 by the initial pitch, um, how did the film change and develop as the context in which it was going to be received changed? And were there any aspects of her life that still were received as too niche in 2018? You know, um, the process over the you know, time of rewriting it was you know, just really honing in um, the story and there were various things um, the the couple who she meets at the salon Gaston de Caive and Jeanne de Caive um, in real life she became obsessed with Jeanne de Caive and, and that was an affair so in an earlier draft we had you know really explored that relationship and um, and so we cut that down we just kind of basically getting more to the core of uh, of what the story was and it seemed a little too early to have the full sexual awakening of Colette at that point in the story so yeah it was just about refining it um, we didn't leave anything out in terms of her um, we, we didn't leave anything out in terms of anything outrageous that she did but interestingly when we were putting the trailer together the distributors were kind of like oh we can't put that in the trailer I'm like why not we're like it's gonna freak people out I'm like this is a woman who lived a hundred years ago and she was so radical, even today, she's still potentially too out there for the mainstream. So hats off to Colette. <laughs> you know, she was ahead of her time. Uh, we have time for one more. So the pressure's on. Make it a good one. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That was an excellent experience tonight. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. I was just um, thinking about when you were talking about the relationship between Colette and Willie, and I liked how you didn't portray him as sinister from the beginning. There was clearly affection between them, and I think he had um, honest affection for her. It wasn't just taking advantage of her, trying to use her. And it made me think about your resource material. Did you have letters that you used or journals from that period of time in her life or through the arc of her life that you covered? And I'm wondering what that experience was like. You know, was that kind of what you used, or was it more interviews or things like that? Actually, yeah. There's a, a very much like a culture around the sort of the real Colette, Colettophiles in France. Um, there's a number of people who have original letters that were written between Colette and Willie and Colette and Missy. So the, our first step was, you know, biographies and reading everything that was written about her and also, um, you know, kind of her own writing has so much stuff in about what was going on in the relationship. So that was the first level. But then it did feel like another level. We, we ended up at this collect, collector's house in an atelier in Pigalle and he had these letters that were in Colette's handwriting, like on this beautiful, you know, fragile turn of the century paper where she was just, they used to write to each other twice a day. Because it was like, you know, sort of texting. <laughs> like it was kind of how they like, stayed in touch. And, and uh, you know, uh, Colette and Missy wrote to each other. And sometimes they use feminine pronouns. I mean, Colette's a very, um, uh, sorry, French is a very gendered language. And then sometimes they'd flip into male pronouns for Missy. So that's why we got the idea of, you know, Colette using he for Missy in the uh, story. And then um, between Colette and Willie, there was also evidence that they still had this enduring sort of attachment to each other really right until the final split, which is over the, this argument over the books. But um, they wrote to each other these very passionate exchanges. Um, he, that thing he says about um, your lightning speed of comprehension, your brief but violent rages, that's all from a letter that Willie wrote to her. And she wrote to him saying, give up your Megs and your classic Claudines, come back to me, which is very much about these kind of Claudine types that Willie was cultivating and attracting in a bit of a pervy way. So, you know, it really gave us an insight into the truth of their relationship that even though it was a very exploitative relationship, there was still something that locked them in. She was like 
a teenager when she got to know him and you know he sort of formed her and she had to break free of that and that's kind of what that final scene's really about between them is that final ah she had to get rid of him in order to grow as an artist and become a true writer it's the best way to end the movie it really Thank was you. You. um we've got to run across town for another q and a uh, so um <laughs> Colette, if you if you love the movie, go on social media, spread the word. And what I like to always say to if you if you didn't like the movie, you could still go on social media, but don't say you didn't like the movie. Okay? Yeah, thank right. you. But anyway, thank, thank Wash uh, Westmoreland for coming out. Here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.